Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 49 of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. Today is January 27th, 2020. I am Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my enchanting co-host, Amy and Jordan. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Y'all, you know, y'all are allowed to say stuff after I say welcome, guys, other than just hello. Well, it's it's weird to start again. I'm pretty sure we, I put in the permits. I mean, I, I don't know. Anyway, in tonight's episode, we are doing something a little bit different. While we are still largely going to talk about the Cosmere tonight, we're also branching out a little bit into some of Brandon Sanderson's writing theories um, and focusing more on what one of what are known as Brandon Sanderson's three laws of magic. Specifically, tonight we are looking at Sanderson's first law. As always, be warned that there will be spoilers in this episode, and those spoilers could cover pretty much anything in the Cosmere. Actually, tonight... We'll try and be nice, but there's a good chance that we're going to spoil some stuff that's not even in the Cosmere necessarily. We'll we'll try and um, say it beforehand too. We, we will try. It. We will try and give you a warning. It and it'll be the kind of spoiler where you should just be able to jump forward thirty seconds, maybe a minute, and then we'll be done, and you can listen on and perhaps stumble into a completely different spoiler entirely. <laughs> Now, for those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube, we do want to remind you that it's possible for our listeners to interact with us live via chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night, starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us, take an active part of the discussion, add to the discussion, help us, you know, give us a, a branch. And, you know, so it's not just us because we're kind of boring. Sometimes. I probably shouldn't tell our audience that we're boring. I used um, to be We're cool. fascinating, <laughs> but. We're especially fascinating to, before. Yes. I used to be with it. Then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what is it is strange and foreign to me. It'll happen to you. Just you it's wait. True. Abraham Simpson. He knows what he's talking Words about. Words of wisdom right there. Indeed. Uh, the Sandersonian... St- wow, why can I not speak today? I promise. The Sandersonian... I make this promise every week, and then I stumble again. <laughs> the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. Our show will, of course, continue to be free, but if you want to help out, please head over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Pledge a couple bucks per episode, or even a buck per episode. It really helps out. Our patrons will get immediate access to our Discord channel, where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. It's a great community. We've got a lot of great discussions. We've got a lot of great people, and some of them are even in chat room in the chat room right now. Mm-hmm. You will but also mostly get we discuss early... prequel memes. No, we don't. <laughs> we have to occasionally talk about them. We also and look at my fine. cosplay stuff. It's fun. Uh huh. Talk about video games. Mm hmm. That's and... been pretty active recently. And we've even also got a uh, shameless self-promotion tab in there yes, for people to go and say, hey, I did something cool. Come check me out. So uh, that's awesome, too. That sound effect anyway, happens every time, too. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great community. Sound. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you'll also get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and just a lot of other happy things. Now, tonight, we want to give a special shout out to, we like to give a special shout out each week to our patrons, and this time, we're giving a shout out to Jake H. So, thank you. You are amazing, and we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Definitely. Okay, so before we dig into Sanderson's first law, we probably want to take a quick look at what are Sanderson's three laws of magic. So, for our listeners who aren't aware... Brandon actually teaches a creative writing class at BYU, at Brigham Young University. Um, He actually took this same class while he was at the school from 
an author known as Dave Wolverton or David starts with an F and I can't think of his David. He wrote the, the rune Lords books. And first I cannot remember his name for the life of me. The, the teacher's name, his actual non pin name is Dave Wolverton. Um, and Dave, Dave Farland, that's it. David Farland. And a lot of famous authors actually, it turns out, t took this class. But Brandon is now teaching it. And one of the main things that he teaches are the three laws of magic. So law number one is an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. Rule number two, Jordan, um, do you have it in front of you? I do not. Do you want me to read two? To Okay, Jordan, I feel like I was a teacher calling on you in the middle of class. And you <laughs> it's all right, I'll cover for Jordan. Something else at the I'll, moment. I'll do number caught two. Me, caught me okay. right looking. Okay, now I don't know where I put my window. Now I'm looking for that. No. Jeez, where did that go? So rule number, or law number two is the limitations of a magic system are more interesting than its capabilities. What the magic can't do is more interesting than what it can. And Jordan, do you have the third one? No, because I think Not I yet. may have closed the window on accident. <laughs> <laughs> Things have gone so well to start. It's amazing. It's all right. I had sound issues. You know, it's, oh, it's here we cool. Go. All, all right. right. Do you uh, have it up? Expand on what you have already before you add something new. I like that one. And then, of course, there is Sanderson's zeroth law, which is air on the side of awesome. Awesome. Now, yes. I feel like... But because the word awesome is kind of tainted in, in relation to Brandon now for me, because as much as I love Lyft, that is my least favorite thing about her. But it still makes sense. It's that's also known as the rule of cool. Mm -hmm. Or it's not cool, quite awesome, that's, that's, awesome. that's not quite the rule of cool, but it, it relies on the rule of cool rather. Yeah. Um. So and tonight's episode is going to be a lot more free form I think the most just because there's not really there's there's not a plot progression to go through so tonight yeah. we're just going to sort of you know talk about different ways that this works both in the Cosmere outside the Cosmere mm -hmm. um, so again the first law is an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic so yes. essentially what this means is it, it's not saying let me go back. Brandon, when he describes this, sort of tells a story of his very first world con. Which I love. Where he, where he was sitting on a panel with a bunch of other writers. And somebody said, or the, the moderator first said, okay, so how should magic work? And Brandon, just confidently, 100%, you know, just thinking this is the number one rule. He said, well, obviously magic should have rules. And apparently everyone else on the panel looked at him and said, no, absolutely not. It should. And he proceeded to spend the next hour getting beat up on by, in his words, several paranormal romance writers. And like after it was Which over, I just he just love is a concept. I've never heard of this genre. <laughs> oh, Jordan, you have so you've much never heard of paranormal romance. <laughs> I'm imagining ghosts and stuff because that's no, what no, I no, no, no. This Twilight. is where you have your werewolves and your vampires. Yeah. And this is where shifters. this is where Twilight sits in the in that the sounds genre. Me like oh. fantasy romance, it's paranormal, ur urban, yeah, paranormal, urban. I anyway, spend too much time I want there. the ghost romance. There's no ghosts. But anyway, he said he said that he left that conference bloodied, <laughs> and he was just like, okay, so because this is one of the things where he was thinking this is in his mind the unbreakable rule. <laughs> well, I mean, and he, he like, that was one of the rules given by Orson Scott Card and his book, like and how to write, how to write fantasy and science fiction. Yeah. And so for him, it's foundational mm -hmm. and everyone else. It's like, why are you trying to bring in rules, man? And, and so he decided that maybe it was time to kind of rethink. He was like, are there other people who write fantasy differently than I do perhaps or differently than I and then he sat down and he said okay so what are the rules for Lord of the Rings there are anybody really. 
<laughs> well, it depends upon what you're talking about. If you're talking about the One Ring, lots of rules. Mm-hmm. We know yeah, exactly there are rules for does. the One Ring. If you're talking but about it, Gandalf, it's whatever J.R. or Tolkien needs, to needs for the yeah. moment. In, in, in Brandon's words, the rule for Gandalf is be Gandalf. Yeah. But, you know, you start looking at that and you think, okay, so there's not a whole lot of rules to Gandalf. But at the same time, they don't use Gandalf to solve a lot of problems. They use him to solve one really big problem mm-hmm. in the Mines of Moria, and then Gandalf is gone. Yep. That's still you a traumatic says, moment for me from when I saw the movie. <laughs> Because I hadn't read the book. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't finished the book. And so I was like, oh, no. And my friends wouldn't tell me. So I. But yeah, so essentially, the, there's a sliding scale between the sense of wonder and problem solving. Which, and that sliding scale represents how satisfying using the magic to solve the problem is for the reader. Mm-hmm. And so. If if the so, character can just like wave their hand and it's fixed, then the challenge is not there in the problem. It's like, well, why did we have this problem at all? Why was this hard for you if you can just wave your hand and it's fixed? Yeah, it basically leads directly to deus ex machina. Mm-hmm. You're just like, well, that was exciting. He snapped his fingers and everything was done. Yay. It's, all well, and it, it's why I, the solving of the the Balrog problem is satisfying, even though... We don't know where the Balrog comes from. Mm -hmm. We don't know why Gandalf specifically has the skills it takes to fight it. But because it's an unknown fighting an unknown, Mm -hmm. it's sort of okay because they cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. Well, and And at the same time, even though we don't know the rules, when you use the magic without knowing the rules, there's, there can often be a big price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In this case, Gandalf. (laughs) Gandalf I mean, it goes over the yeah. ledge. And well, and the other reason it works is because we don't... That, that's not the central problem. He didn't solve mm-hmm. the big issue. He just allowed them to continue on the main quest. Right. And, and by not solving the big problem with the magic... Cause, I mean, it always gets to the problem, the, the how it should have ended. Why don't we just call the eagles to start? Mm-hmm. Which I still don't have a satisfying I, I answer for, for the record. I can't hear you guys. I don't record. know what's going on. I can see Mel's moving, but I can't hear anything. Uh oh. This, is this sounds like what happened to me. You don't happen to have like multiple plugins. She can't hear me. Why am I asking? Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to my other headphones, so I will rejoin the conversation <laughs> soon when I can actually right. hear. We'll things. continue while she's doing. Oh, yeah. Then. All right. So keep up what you were saying, Jordan. Uh, yeah. So I still don't have a satisfying answer as to why the Eagles couldn't help out at the start. I've never heard something that makes sense to me. Uh, because they would have been shot down. Now that the that barred door has collapsed, the eagles can come in. Oh, so this is barrier. an infinite range tower, apparently? Yes. Oh, it just feels like we could have maybe found a more roundabout way. No. Nope. Oh, the, okay. I just feel whenever end. you have a, an air force okay. in medieval times, you should always there. use the air force in medieval times. It feels broken. I don't know. Maybe it just took them that long to get there. There's also another thing that works with authors you trust. Mm-hmm. The fact that, like, a professor in chat just brings up the fact that we see Allomancy used before we know its rules and how it works. Right. And so that gets to sort of the concept of it gives a sense of wonder before we get explanation. But mm-hmm. more importantly, if you trust the writer... Which, at the point you most people would have read Lord of the Rings, you would have already, you know, mm-hmm. trusted. Uh, I mean, heck, by the time the Eagles show up, is they don't show up till the last book, right? Very, very end. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of them rescues Gandalf from the tower, but that's, that's actually right. in that's actually in a descriptive backstory. Yeah. Like that happens kind of off screen. And so it's one of those things you trust the author at that point, and so. I can see things being done with magic that I don't understand. And I trust that Brandon understands why it's happening. And because I trust Brandon understands, it's not an issue. It's when I don't trust the author, it's an issue. The other thing that Brandon has said, he he mentions that there is, it's not an exception to the rule, but it's okay to break this rule. Um, in, In some situations, 
the resolution to the conflict doesn't need to be satisfying, particularly at the beginning of books when you're not deeply invested. It's a little bit more okay to break this rule because you're because it's not this a whole lot of build up and then just sort of that was it. There's you know there there hasn't been the build up yet. It's sort of building the world around the story. And so unfortunately it looks like Amy still has no sound. We'll keep going without her, but Oh, that's frustrating. Um, I wonder if her battery Okay, died. so I can sort of hear, but you guys are super quiet, but you can continue and I'll figure out how to not have it be super quiet. Okay. All right. But no, this that's a, that's a, I like that point just because, yeah, early on we're allowed to have a little more wonder. Mm-hmm. And, well, and that's part of the thing is you're building wonder at that point. You're not necessarily solving because, again, we see elements he used, but it's not necessarily used to solve a huge problem. It's used to build up Kelsier as a character. Ugh. Figured it out. It wasn't plugged in all the way. Awesome. Sorry. So so we, we were just <laughs> saying. It, yeah. Lots of things. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about lots of things. So you basically, basically missed out like on the best stuff that we were. I know, ever going to say. I know. It's it so always fortunate. happens. I don't know what happened the, with the headphones. In the so. meantime, on behalf of Amy, no, just <laughs> no, <laughs> don't do that to me. Oh, I no, don't like um, seeing the waveforms of my laugh. It's very staccato. I'm now self-conscious. Uh, staccato laughs. <laughs> That's the name of my Black Keys cover band. Cover my laughing gas cover band. Okay, I like it. I'll take it. <laughs> you win this round. Anyway, so we were uh, we were just talking about how sometimes it's okay to break Brandon er, Sanderson's first law, mm-hmm. particularly towards the beginning of books, because and it's not necessarily even breaking that law. It's when you have a situation where resolution of the problem doesn't need to necessarily be satisfying. Yeah. Like if and you just so, need that to be fixed, like it was something to establish and then move on past it. Well, thinking mm-hmm. of a, a Lord of the Rings example, when the hobbits are at, what's it called? The Prancy Pony or whatever. Mm-hmm. The Prancy mm-hmm. Pony, yeah. Yeah, and they, and we see that the the ring race are out for them and like, how are they going to get out of this? They don't, first of all, they're a bunch of idiots at that point. <laughs> and they, are, you know, at least two they're of them sheltered. are drunk. Yeah. And... It's just like, how are they going to get out of this? Oh, Aragorn's going to come save the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, well, who's this guy? It doesn't matter. He's cool. You're going to like him. It's important. It establishes his character early on. He's confident. Mm-hmm. He's or competent. And he knows what's up. And, and he's, that's he what doesn't that use, scene is supposed to do. It's not supposed to be satisfying. It's supposed to set up his character. And he doesn't yes. fix it with magic either. Exactly. He fixes well, it with being smart and changing rooms. Right. And just so we're clear, Aragorn. What I say? Aragorn is the dragon. There, there's an R that I always forget is there. Yeah. Aragorn. Well, it's, um, Aragorn it's, isn't it's even the dragon. Sure He's the writer I'm of sure the dragon. Will be fine. It's the, no, I'm talking about the dragon book is what I'm saying. Well, I, I know. I'm saying, but the dragon isn't. It's it's the writer's name, and I don't like that I just, series. I don't think there's anyone anyway. who's too obsessed with Lord of the Rings that they'll get pissed at me, right? I am right forgive now. Forgive him, oh. okay? Just forgive him. Oh, does, are you called bag? Oh, oh interesting. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this got awkward. So. Anyway. Yeah. Anywho. <laughs> but yeah, but at the same time, again, a lot of times there is a sense of wonder that's necessary. Uh, another description that Brandon uses is like legendary stories when you're dealing with Greek pantheons. Mm -hmm. The magic actually comes from the gods and it's literally awesome by its most literal definition. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, you know, it, it but the thing is it can get out of control and it can cause some major problems if you don't really understand what you're doing. And so, yeah, it's just, so you, so you're allowed to have a hard magic system or a soft magic system um, soft being more sense, more on the sense of wonder into the spectrum, and hard being more on the rules based like into Mistborn, the spectrum. You know, like where both it's of very them scientific. are completely valid. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. but it depends on how you actually use them. One other thing. This is not just for magic. This also works in science fiction. Uh, It's not specifically about fantastical settings. It's more of a storytelling law than a fantasy law. Yeah, like um, of course the of, of course the the rule any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, mm-hmm. yeah. and well, so it just sort of, my, of works in the same. One of my favorite uses of this is actually in a non fictional story. Um, hmm? Have either of you seen the movie Moneyball? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the whole concept for those who haven't seen it, it's all about baseball. It's about the Oakland Athletics in the late nineties, early aughts, where. Basically, they're a poor team. They can't compete with the big teams. And so what they do is they use advanced statistical measurements to try and figure out where people are undervaluing certain players. And so the whole thing is like statistics are sort of treated like a magic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they explain how it works and why it works early on. But you sort of just have to take it on the faith that Statistics is magic in the terms of this because no one else is using it. And so Mm -hmm. even though it's a non-fictional story, it's treated the same way. The same way as like a talent scout just sort of looks and, oh, I know he's going to be a good player based on how he's the one I need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it it actually can be used in a lot of different settings. It's kind of interesting. Right. Yeah. um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, So. Let's take a look at a couple different stories where this might come into play. Because, you know, Brandon has used the Lord of the Rings as a major one, obvious, mm-hmm. mainly because it's one of the most it's, well-known. I mean, it's, it, the, it it's the granddaddy of modern fantasy. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I realized when I was going through my bookshelves to find the books with different magic systems that I was like, I read a lot of soft magic, and I didn't realize that until I reflected on it. Because I think most of my hard magics are all Sanderson books. Like, all the other ones are <laughs> fairly soft. But in a lot of those, magic is not the focus of the story. It's just part of the setting. Mm-hmm. And so it's, well, there's this romance or this situation, and there happens to be magic. And so mm-hmm. when they use the magic, it doesn't fix as many problems. It's more just kind of an extra flavor or a little thing to it. And I think that's one of the main reasons that Brandon is known for his magic systems is because with him, it's a major part of the plot. Mm -hmm. Like it's what drives a lot of the story forward is the use of this magic system. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a hard magic or science fiction system is really difficult because we know how the world should work and to make it hard puts a lot of limits and I think a lot of authors when they start they're not focused on how the magic works they're focused on oh I don't know the story they want to tell Mm -hmm. and the magic is more used to as a as a plot device to service that story whereas Brandon the two sort of coexist at the same time Brandon's a bit of a unique author in that regard but more importantly um to invoke tv tropes which for those of you whose day I ruined because now you want to go look up tv tropes (laughs) Buckle up. I might reference a few of them today. One of the most common types is called the one big lie, where the Mm -hmm. world is basically indistinguishable from the one that we live in, except for one thing that's different. One of the one of the best examples would be an Ender's Game, the technology Mm -hmm. that exists in that future of the Ansible, which lets them instantaneously communicate across infinite distance. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. the one big lie. Otherwise, the physics that they they talk about is basically stuff that we can imagine and think up with our modern world Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the ansible is the one that breaks all physics as we understand it well it's like i've I've been playing a lot of portal lately i decided (laughs) i I, I missed it it's been a long time i went back and played it the game is pretty you know intuitive the only difference is oh i can shoot portals at the wall and go through them and everything else works though yeah i mean it, it that that one change changes a mm-hmm. lot especially with how you go through it and i still haven't finished playing the the two i think it's portal two <laughs> where you can do multiplayer and i'm terrible at it what, but you, like but like the yeah. saying that went like the catchphrase that went with the game was now you're thinking with portals because mm-hmm. you have that, to tweak that, how you think about well how am i going to get up there oh wait but if i can get to that spot and then jump to there and then whoop, then there you go right. but it's you really have to change your thinking a lot to do it mm-hmm 
And it messes you up for a couple days once you're done with it. <laughs> That's true. No, that but is actually, very, Port- very true. Portal has another really good example of soft magic systems. Because, again, it's not bad to be a soft magic system. Mm-hmm. But think of mm-hmm. the, the long fall boots that we see on Shell's oh. feet. Yeah. Is it explained how the long fall boots somehow <laughs> prevent you from shattering your entire skeletal system when you <laughs> like reach terminal over and velocity. over and over again oh my goodness but yeah no, like i think they because, did because because they put it on there we assume oh well i don't it's know fine. how these things work but at least they thought well, of it and it makes they, me okay yeah well, it's I think not they just did. that though all, all you need to know is that they exist that's mm-hmm. the extent of the problems they solve is i'm gonna fall a lot this stops me from falling and they or, I, from from her getting hurt when I fall. Yeah, I think they they did testing on the game, and people were like, "Well, shouldn't her legs shatter?" And they're like, "Oh," and they put those on, and they're like, "Oh, okay, it's fine. She's got things. She's she's good. There's something to mm-hmm. to fix that problem." People just want but, an answer. They're not even mm-hmm. necessarily looking but, for a good one. And and they don't. It, and but, you don't always want a big, long, complicated one answer either. You just want, oh, there's something that takes care of it. But again, it follows the scale of the problem that it solves in the scope of the of the game is is just as small as the it's just basically here's an answer for x it doesn't this isn't like what saves her from you know like basically what propels her to the end of the game but it is just sort of an explanation for the problem that it does solve Mm -hmm. um meanwhile over the course of the game especially in the second one there are more different things that are introduced until at the very end, you know, there, there's a, a conflict and the final shot you take has been explained over the course of the game. Very throwaway, but it, it works. It's just one of those things where at that point, it's very, very intuitive what you need to do. Hmm. And it makes sense in solving the game. You actually feel really smart for doing it because it's just like, I'm awesome. <laughs> Now I have to finish it. Yes, you do. But I have if to like, anything, restart. people just need to go find a video of Cave Johnson <laughs> quotes and make themselves laugh all day. Uh, uh, J. Jonah Jameson. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder why Cave Johnson wants me to get pictures for Spider-Man. Though. It's really kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, but it just it shows up over the course of a lot of different things. Now... Another one that Brandon likes to point out in Harry Potter, it's true within individual books. Over the course of the series, the rules aren't quite as consistent. They use something within a book and then the next book, they've forgotten it exists. Time turners. But there, it, it still works. It's sort of a hybrid series. Like he, yeah. he, he calls that kind of a hybrid. With, it reminds when me I of was... a lot of comic books. Yeah, that it's like, oh, Which I need to fix another... this problem. But mm-hmm. um, like, it seems like, especially with Harry Potter, that it, it feels slightly more consistent when you think about that Harry, the character, only knows a few spells at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then as he learns more and more spells, he can do more and more complicated things. But there's still the problem like of some characters like Dumbledore or what Voldemort does with stuff that is never fully mm-hmm. explained, even if Harry is told it's such and such magic and it's like a different branch. And so it kind of gives some more mm-hmm. explanation to make it feel not quite as soft, even if it's mm-hmm. still fairly fluffy. Now, an interesting example is if you look at the King Killer Chronicles, a lot of people who are fans of Brandon Sanderson have probably read these. If you haven't, I don't know if I feel good recommending that you do, because I don't know that if we're ever going to get the third book. I, I genuinely am not sure. But the magic systems in there, there are two of them. And one of them is very, very hard. And one of them is very, very soft. And it's just abs- it's really interesting that the way that they're used. Because in the Kingkiller Chronicle, you've got sympathy, which is your very, very hard magic system. There are specific rules. There are, um, and, and a lot of it is explained to us over the course of the book. That's why the main character is at this academy. And, you know, he's learning it. And so we learn alongside him. And the things that he can do with it, you know, they grow as he learns more. And then there's naming. And naming is one of the softest (laughs) um, magic systems out there. 
because it's very, just very, very inexplicable. It's very hard of the cards. Yes, <laughs> that's that's a good way of describing it. If you're a Yu-Gi-Oh fan, is this is this the name of the Win series, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, because I was trying yeah. to remember what it was, and it's been a long time since I've read that, and I've only there's read also, like the first one. There's also the third one that's interesting, which is alchemy, which we see mm. the effects of, but we don't know the rules of. But it's heavily implied there are heavy rules mm-hmm. involved with it. And but but, but our main character, but our main character doesn't know them, and as such, he isn't able to use them. It's a it's a really, yeah, I, I like it that. It's another very, very hard science magic hybrid that he knows nothing about to the point where he is told he knows nothing about it in great, greatly amusing way. <laughs> Come to think of it, it actually those three sort of remind me of the of the trio of magic systems in Mistborn in that we learned first about allomancy and its rules mm-hmm. are very well understood as far as mm-hmm equal and opposite reactions and this is you know metal a does thing a Mm -hmm. and then ferrugami is going on in the background and we see some of it being used but we don't quite understand it for a lot of the book Mm -hmm. and then we know far in the background there's there's hemallergy which is sort of acting as naming in that there are, we know that there are rules to it, that it is a magic system, but we don't know the full limitations of it because we've seen it, because it can do anything from, you know, we're going to make a, a blob monster into a sentient blob monster. We're going to turn a collection of humans into a horrible thing. It can steal powers and maybe can steal destiny. Just know that whatever it is, it's horrible, but we don't really know what it can yeah. do. It's mm-hmm. just scary and gruesome. Well, especially when you start considering it outside of the bounds of Scadrial, what it can do, which, you know, Chris has said, this is probably the most interesting one based on how it will interact with other magic systems. It's horrifying. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, you know, Chris is very much a scholar. Mm -hmm. And and this is where you get into the whole discussion of do you trust the author? Mm -hmm. Because... We don't know what hemallergy can do, but Brandon could have it do anything at this point. And unless it's something really strange, we're going to assume that Brandon has a reason for this. Mm-hmm. And it's why it's it's why the rules are interesting that he has for himself, because we know he follows them as as much as possible. And so mm-hmm. we assume he knows the magic system. And that's when he talks about that first meeting at, uh, was it Gen Con? I can't remember which one it was. Worldcon? Uh, Worldcon, I believe. Worldcon. And he, and everyone's like, no, why would you have rules? And that's what I hear from that author when they say, why would you have rules? It's, I don't know the rules for the magic system. So why would you put rules on the magic system? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I want to say something. I am, not entirely positive it's world come because that may have been the example that he was saying no it wasn't there so it was some convention in boston if you know where it is let us know yes (laughs) it it, it was at some some writing convention in Mm -hmm. boston it was the first time he was a on a panel Mm -hmm. i just want to make sure i'm like we could be saying the exact wrong thing (laughs) but just just clearing that up but no, for 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 a hard magic system to work, the writer does have to fully understand the magic system before mm-hmm. he starts, and Bring. they need to know what it what it does to the rest of the world, not just how mm-hmm. it works within the magic users, but how it affects everybody else. Because if you have it that magic can do X, Y, and Z, but then you still have those same industries and they're not being utilized or they're not being subsidized or whatever by magic then it doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense within the context of the whole yeah. world and which so is going into this world is why building, it but... takes someone who plans as deeply and mm-hmm. as long term as brandon does to really even approach something like this stephen king he has a lot of magic systems going on in his stuff but it only works because so much of the magic is from horrible eldritch <laughs> things that are supposed to be unknowable and so right mm-hmm. to the, the point sen- where if you know it you go insane yeah, and so the whole point Pulling is Cthulhu, survival. Cthulhu. It's never about understanding the magic system. It's about escaping the magic system. Mm-hmm. It, it, it lets you, 
Well, and that's why the magic system, (coughs) it doesn't solve problems. It causes problems. And yeah, ones that just cause problems actually tend to be just fine. Yeah. But it, it's when you want to fix problems with it, it either makes it too easy or it, you need to understand what's going on with it to make it feel satisfying for the reader, which has been said, I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah. Well, cause that's the thing. It's all about satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's about satisfaction. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Meanwhile, Bill's it's also dying. about. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm fine. I'm just glad to see Ish. the doctor <coughs> the same joke I did at the exact same moment. That's good. But uh, he says I'm dying on air. I'm actually dying of lack of air. <coughs> but um, no, but that, that's the thing is it's not just a matter of satisf- satisfaction. It's also a matter of uh, tension mm-hmm. and <coughs> a, uh, a satisfying resolution to that tension. Well, if the magic is coming and causing the tension, then, you know, it's it's not causing the problem. You know, it, it, it's not breaking this law. It's mm-hmm. using magic as a solution, not as a problem solve or a problem <coughs> source. So, you know, so, so like that, and that's kind of part of horror is not knowing like you're, you're facing insurmountable odds. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and I mean, like that's, with a lot of like movies and and I don't usually read horror, but I watch some light, light horror. I don't go very dark. Um, Mm -hmm. But it seems like the ones where you see the monster or whatever it is really early on are Mm -hmm. not as satisfying as the ones where it's all the tension of you almost see it. You hear it, but you don't see it. And you almost, almost, almost. And then when you finally do, it's the tension has built to to a much bigger point. And it's usually more satisfying as long as they haven't done the monster in a terrible way. Well, and that's kind of the difference between a uh, a thriller and suspense. Mm-hmm. You know, you have an, a thriller. If you see the monster early on, then you've got an action movie or a thriller. If you see the movie or if you see the monster, if you don't see the monster until later, that's when you've got suspense. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's one example that really interests me as I was trying to think about how, how exactly it works is The Princess Bride. You know, there's not a whole lot of magic in it, but the little bit that's there is Miracle Max. Yeah. And what he does really does kind of break this rule because it's a big solution and it kind of is a deus ex machina. But because of the kind of story the Princess Bride is, the Princess Bride is, while not necessarily a parody, (laughs) it's a sidelong wink at your standard story uh, fairy tales. Yeah, it, it does not take itself super seriously, it doesn't feel where, like it. It's, it's having fun the whole way. And so it's sort of a, a loving nod to it's just like, yep, we know it's, uh, it's uh, deus ex machina. Deal with it. We're doing and, it. <laughs> and, but, but, but again, it's very, very intentional. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, as, as a writer, one of the rules that I've sort of developed for myself. Um, And it's like, if I were to say Bill's first law, it would be as long as you know why you're breaking a rule and you're doing it intentionally, you're allowed to break whatever rule you want, Mm -hmm. but it's just breaking a rule, even a grammatic rule out of ignorance. That's the problem. Yeah. And in that instance, they are very, very directly breaking Sanderson's first law, but it's very, very intentional. Mm-hmm. The, the other thing, though, with that is the problem it solves, once again, isn't the final problem. All it does is act as sort of a, an undo button for something that was also sort of equally unexplained, whatever that torture device was. Right. Yeah, that's... Well, the other thing is, if you've read the book, at the very end... It's so sad. Well, the, 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 the end of, like, first off, there's just so many wonderful things about that book. And the mm. ending is supposedly the false ending. The, the happy ending that we get is supposedly a false ending. And there's another one that, quote, S. Morgenstern, who, spoiler alert, everybody, didn't really exist. Mm. 
Um, <gasps> that it was supposedly the original <laughs> ending that he wrote was that um, Inigo's wound reopened. Uh, Fezzik's horse Butter- loses a shoe. No, so, Buttercup's horse Butter- threw a shoe. Fezzik lost the way, and Wesley has a relapse. Yeah, so it's everything's gone terrible. <laughs> And the sound of the dogs, you know, From was coming castle. closer, closer, closer. And that's the end of the book. It's like, no. And so technically, as Morgenstern didn't break this rule, because while it saved them in the moment, <laughs> it went back. You know, it's just yeah, it's easy just... come, easy go. Mm-hmm. And so it it's a spoiler for <laughs> prof asks if that's a spoiler some people don't realize that s morgenstern didn't actually exist and that william goldman wrote the book and didn't actually translate it i remember my heart was broken when i realized as a child that there wasn't actually an unabridged version you know i was like i want to read this horrible 800 page version that he keeps talking <laughs> But, oh yeah, I think yeah. I watched the movie a lot longer before I even touched the book. Oh, so long before I touched long the book. Long before, yeah. But yeah, it's just the point that the magic part of it isn't really it doesn't need to be explained in that story because it's not the focus mm-hmm. of the story. The focus is right. the dynamic <clears throat> of these people trying to solve this insane problem. Mhm. Mm-hmm. You know, that actually kind of reminds me of Scott Pilgrim versus the world in a strange way. <laughs> if you think about the it, they'd never explain this weird video game magic that this world exists in. Oh, yeah. But that's... Scott somehow gets an extra <clears throat> life after defeating the Katayanaga twins. We don't know why the extra life shows up. We just know he gets one. The thing about the Scott Pilgrim movie is that it is very, very like all these solutions are deeply unsatisfying, but because so much of it is done tongue in cheek and in such an amusing way, we forgive that. Mm-hmm. But it, you, but you can't say that it's satisfying because when you're watching the movie, he gets an extra life and we're just like, wait, what, what just happened? <laughs> and they just keep going. The yep. movie just keeps going, and so you're just like, okay, well, ho- hold on. If I, if I think about this too much, I'm going to miss the rest of the movie. So. <laughs> well, it's just it's small things like, wh- why can Ramona go through people's dreams to get around? Uh, superhero because. logic. She just has uh-huh. that power. She just okay. can. Yeah. Why can Scott in- why- turn people into coins? And it's, uh, Well, he was trained by, uh, by Wallace. Okay, why does that one guy know everyone? Because he does, that's what his function is, okay? Just let him be. <laughs> that's his but purpose. Again, but again, it's very deliberately. You know, they're, they're breaking this law, but they're intentionally breaking it. The only power I think they explain in the end is why veganism gives you superpowers, because 90% of your brain is clogged up by curds and whey or whatever it was. <laughs> anyway. Oh... Uh, so Amy, there's a few in here that you've mentioned that I'm not familiar with. Yes. You've got in the so, notes. so I don't, a lot of them can be covered by it's soft magic and it's like, a it's this paranoia romance that you've never heard of Jordan. Um, but there's like the Mercy Thompson series by Patricia Briggs and it's like werewolves and vampires. And that's, that's kind of the one lie thing that we were talking about earlier, how it's mostly the normal world, but there's all these paranormal elements that normal people don't know about. Well, and And, part of that also works because vampires and werewolves are such a trope at this point mm -hmm. that people already, you know, it's just like, you don't have to explain it to them. Yeah, I mean, they they, they explain a little bit of how they tweak it, like the magic that they mostly have is there's like vampire magic, but that kind of fits in with one of the many versions that are, that have been told through um, but, modern media, but like the werewolf thing, their only real change is that they have pack magic where they can like talk to each other and give each other strength and stuff like that. But that's fairly soft in how they do it. And it's not mm-hmm. used to fix too many big problems. It's more like they need this rising action to help them just a little bit. And that's when they pull mm-hmm. it in. All I can think like, of is uh, it's, it sounds like an extremely specific walkie talkie. <laughs> it kind of is. Yeah, it's yeah. But like it's, when it's a guilty pleasure book. When you start off with something that well known, you still are playing within this, you know, within the bounds of this, mm-hmm. because first off, the reader comes to it already knowing more than they would from a less well known, you know, concept. 
Yeah. You know, Brandon invents brand new concepts. Yeah. And so he's Vampires got to explain. aren't Condra. <laughs> no. And so that and so that's one of the reasons you end up with you know, five, six, seven, one thousand, thirteen hundred page books. You because there's so it. much to explain. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, with but meanwhile, when you're working with vampires and werewolves, it's folklore that people already know. Mm-hmm. All you really need to explain is how this differs from what they know. Yeah, it's it's how they're they're tweaking it slightly. Or mm-hmm. oh, this part is real in this world, but not this other part. Um. Mm-hmm. Let's see. And there was also, so have you guys read Dresden Files? I've read the first one. Have you, Jordan, at all? No, so, but oh my I, know, I know so Surprise. many of the cool moments of it. Yeah, so I, there's no way. There's like 20 books. It's it's maybe not 20, but there's a lot of books now. Um, but this is another one where and magic And the audiobooks exists. are phenomenal, by the way. Yeah, I haven't they're, listened they're, to too many of them, but I've heard good things about them. Um, but But it's... Harry Dresden is a is a wizard and he does magic and he, as he kind of has to level his way through the different books and he gets more spells as he goes through and a lot of it is based on how your belief system works like he he has instead of like a cross or something like that to protect him from things like from vampires he has a pentagram which is a magic mm-hmm. type symbol and so that since he believes in magic that works like a crosswood on a vampire for him. Interesting. So, I mean, it has, it, it's, it's very much a, there's normal world stuff, but there's paranormal things underneath the surface. And mm-hmm. they, he does a really, really good job of working in things. Like he even has in one of his short stories, a reference to some baseball team that has a horrible winning streak. Like they just mm-hmm. cannot win for the life of them. Like they'll get to the, almost get to the world series and they won't. And it's, and there's like some, urban legend about how there was a goat that got yep, um, cubs insult yes yeah, they they got insulted and so and he explains it in in how it works in his world and it's it's just kind of it's really fun how he fits in things and so magic fixes some problems but you know enough about how the magic works for it to work in the same sliding uh-huh. scale thing so it's it's a fun series but it gets crazy and everything that happens through the whole series because it's so big Interesting. Um, but it's it's really fun to read if if you're looking for a fun romp and especially the really early books are really easy to just go oh that was a fun adventure and put it down and you can not be too mm-hmm. concerned about it but as it gets later there's bigger bigger worldwide things to well, worry yeah, about because you can't do avengers and then you know have smaller <laughs> stakes no it just doesn't work no yeah and, and again, the audiobooks are phenomenal. James Marsters does the narration. He's uh, if you're not Spike familiar, and Buffy, he, right? The guy, yeah, he's the guy who plays <laughs> Spike in Buffy. Um, okay. But, but, he's, but he's not using his fake British accent. He's using his... Because I believe James Marsters actually is American. I don't know. That's um, terrible at knowing that. But he does a great job narrating. He, like, the, the voice for, for Harry Dresden is just incredible. And he... He's he's one of the best narrations out there. Hmm. So, and from what I hear, he's also a really really nice guy. So, hmm. um. and no, we're not being paid by James <laughs> Marsters to promote him. No, as... no we're not. And now our first sponsor <laughs> on six seven, but we're open to it. Um, very specifically, James Marsters. <laughs> <laughs> we, and we we just uh, we just blew Prof's mind in uh, in chat. He doesn't realize. <laughs> Yep, that is actually Spike, who is reading yeah. the book for you. Um, no, one of the <clears> other <throat> books that I like reread over and over and over again is it's another romance book, but it's Tinker by Wen Spencer, and it has elves. But in that one, it's fairly science heavy, and uh-huh. it, it it pulls in the magic is science from a different world, and so the main character Tinker she ends up with lots of different things happening to her, but she knows science really well. And so she's able to apply it to the magic as she's going through it. And so it's, it's interesting. And there's, they have to pull in physics and calculus and other stuff. And they, they explain it in a light enough way that if you know it better then you would be like, Oh yeah, they're doing it right. But I don't know it. So I'm just assuming they're doing it right. Or at least I'm hoping that they're doing it right. Um, Uh But it, it's it's nice to see her fixing problems with science, but they're magic. So it's 
kind of a fun thing that way. That actually makes me think of another series. I haven't read this series in years, but it was a really fascinating concept <clears throat> where there's this magical world and they're under attack by, you know, by big baddies, yada, yada, yada. And so they cast a spell to bring a wizard from another realm to help save them because all of their wizards are dead or gone. But they, they are able to, you know, su- you know, summon all their magic to pull in this one wizard. And it pulls a guy from our world. And he's a computer program. <gasps> I think my sister read this series. And it's just, it's a really interesting way of working with it because he is not able to, like, he's barely able to do anything with magic. But he's able to set up a series of very, very small spells and call those spells with other spells and basically creates magic <laughs> as a computer program. Yeah. Object oriented magic is pretty awesome. It, it's exactly mm-hmm. how it is. And uh, I think it's the first book is called Heaven Wizards help you Bane. if you end up creating an infinite loop, though. <laughs> no, I, th- I think it's called Wizards Bane by, uh, by Rick Cook. Is, I, I think that's it. I, looked, I just looked it up and I was oh, like, I think that's the one. There's, but, there's another series and I, my sister read it. I didn't read it. She's a librarian, mm-hmm. so she's read way more books than me. Um, but she, it was a similar type thing. And it was, but the lady who got pulled in to to do the magic the magic was based on perfect pitch and so she was like an opera singer or something like that and so she was able to do perfect pitch and so she was able to do really powerful magic because she could sing So basically in this world disney princesses (laughs) would reign oh yes (laughs) they already use it to control animals why not just do everything else but i just thought that the idea of again the concept of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic well in this one the two actually work together and it was Mm -hmm. just a really cool concept and as he's studying it explains the ideas behind programming which Mm. as itself explains the ideas behind the magic and i just thought it was a really interesting way of looking at something like this yeah that is cool well and actually you can see this entire thing operate in real life if you've ever worked a call center like i did people would call up who have no clue what the computer does they don't understand it they're super old they didn't have to deal with these things and they're frustrated because they can't get verified through our automated system and they would say things like well why doesn't it just know it's me because to them they don't understand it Mm -hmm. therefore it can it they can't do anything with it but it can do everything with it as far mm-hmm. as they're concerned, because it's not understood. And so we talk right. about getting a satisfying answer to them. It's magic. Why can't you get the magic box to just do the thing I want? And it's like, yeah. well, because it's not magic. There, also, i paid <laughs> not enough to be able to make this happen. So call center jobs. They're fun, kids. <laughs> do them. Uh I I don't know that that's one that I ever, ever want to do as a <laughs> builds character. Oh. Look what well, it then. did for me. Oh goodness. <laughs> oh goodness. On that note, maybe it, we should start wrapping up. But <laughs> <laughs> um, any other just examples of this where, that y'all can think of, right off you know, off the top of your heads. I'm looking if back not, at my can... books, and I and I don't know that any you know, of them are th- going to give a different perspective. The fact that it's a, I, I like just the 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 fact that he throws that it needs to be satisfying into the rule mm-hmm. that because you can use magic in a bad way and just it doesn't feel good. C- mm-hmm. Compare like the ex- the well, ending of Thor Ragnarok to the original th- or to Thor two, where. Uh-huh. It, He's, it's not really explained in Thor 2. It just sort of happens. He gets his, you know, his extra abilities or whatever. Or maybe that was Thor 1. I could be putting the two together. Thor but, 2 is... No. I'm not sure what point you're making, so I can't. Okay, so the point is about it being satisfying. We see Thor in Ragnarok. We see hints that he's actually the Thunder God. Uh-huh. And so mm-hmm. when he finally gets that power boost... It feels uh-huh. much more satisfying than power boosts and uh, that he gets it other times because it's just sort of, oh, now Thor can do this. Mm-hmm. I think, you think you must of- mean the, I think you mean the first one. 
because he gets his powers back and it, it feels like all of a sudden just because he's willing to sacrifice himself it's like oh now you're worthy and so well, and well, he's think, even more powerful the frustra- than before i think the frustration in it is more along the lines of why did he get his powers back then i don't know i don't know so it, it it didn't it wasn't as smooth well, in how it transitioned and explained things i i think the whole thing yeah sorry um i think this rule can kind of be summed up in a moment from uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. You know, at the very end, uh, when they're assaulting Starkiller Base, and Finn's just like, we can do it. We'll use the Force. And Han looks at him just <laughs> incredulously, just like, that's not how the Force it works. It does not work that way. You know, and, and the thing is, Han, first <laughs> off, started the series as a complete unbeliever. And so for him just being like, Dude, no, that's no. not how this works. And and it's just like, that's how you don't want the reader to be in your book. It's just like, th- that's not how that works. What do you do with it? This does not work this way. No. It, so, you know, it's, there's it's, like it's, some... It's, oh, man. it's the difference between Superman solving the problem by going around the world super fast in a way that breaks physics. But we're like, well, I mean, Superman can go around the world. And that annoys me. But it doesn't annoy me anywhere near as much as the memory erasing kiss. <laughs> Where, Which is funny. Brandon actually mentions that during his does lecture. He, where does <laughs> yes. this problem? The memory come erasing from? kiss is the dumbest thing ever. Where he just pulls this power out of his butt. Where he kisses Lois and then suddenly she doesn't remember that he's Superman. What? <laughs> My favorite is it's explored in Robot Chicken where Superman actually uses this more. To make villains forget why they hate him. <laughs> it leads to some very awkward moments. But it's just one of those great things. It's like, yeah. What happens if you actually explore the idea? Does it break the world completely and horribly? Then it's probably a bad a bad example mm-hmm. of this rule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Um, I've, I'll go into a little bit more of this later when I'm talking about what I'm doing with the innkeeper's table. But I have been playing a game that I kind of love and it's kind of my new obsession at the moment. It's called Betrayal Legacy, which is a version of the game Betrayal at House on the Hill, if you're familiar with it. But everything that happens in a round of the game affects what will what can happen in future rounds. Um, but one of the rules at the very end, it says, if there is a card that gives you an insanely unbalanced game breaking moment, that's probably not its intention. And, and it's just like, that's kind of the way it works. If there is something that just makes everything broken suddenly, that's probably not the way it should work. Yeah, because otherwise, why would the world have made it this far if there's something that could break it that easily? Exactly. It just doesn't flow with logic. But yeah. Um, now, though, it's time to thank our patrons again, because thanks to you, We are able to hold monthly giveaways and all of our giveaways are open to everyone and free to enter. Um, So just as a reminder, we are giving away a paperback copy of Mistborn, the final empire. And Jordan, uh, do you have the number? And Amy? Okay. I have the list. All right. All right. I am clicking the generate button. It will generate an integer. And it generated dr- the number one. <laughs> All right. Who's number one? Mariel Clark. All right. So, Mariel, we will contact you and get that sent out to you as soon as possible. Now, as a reminder, the way people entered this was they were supposed to pick a Cosmere story and cast it entirely with Muppets. Do you want me to read And hers? let us know... Um, if you're, you're welcome to, so there's pick a cosmic story. This was easily our with, best caption idea. Cast it with Muppets and have one character as a human, which ah. character is the human. And if you have ideas for the Muppets, those are all sorts of fun. Hold on. Ah, ah. My pages are jumping around on me and it's not okay. Technical difficulties. Okay. You can find it. So, Mariel's answer was Elantris. Everyone is puppets but the Seance, who were all played by Stanley Tucci. <laughs> I remember loving that one. And who's Stanley uh, Tucci, Bill? Remind me. Stanley Tucci's an actor. He's in uh, just about everything. I, the one that I 
told Jordan so that he would know is he was the guy who gave Captain America his powers. He's in seriously everything. I just like um, to explain things in a way that Jordan can understand. Explain it in comic books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or there comic was... book movies. Oh, there's another one. Oh, this is another fun one. There was one from Pondering Books on Instagram, and it said, Warbreaker, Susan Braun would be played by Keanu Reeves. And I just, I like Keanu Reeves is fun anyway. <laughs> he is ageless. I still say that uh, yeah. if they ever do a biopic of Keanu Reeves, the young version should be Adam Driver. <laughs> I've seen all those things about it. That's pretty funny. There's oh. things about it? Well, there, there's like people do memes and stuff like that, and they'll have their pictures oh. side by side. Oh, I didn't even know that. It's a thing. That was just my personal thought. No, it's a thing. There was another, I can't remember who did the the one where it was like, they actually give the Muppets and Mistborn, and they have Gonzo as yes. Kelsier, and I'm like, that actually makes a lot of sense. I still I would prefer Gonzo as the Lord Ruler. I just feel like Gonzo would be wonderful as the Lord Ruler. My brother said that uh, that clubs should be Statler and Waldorf. Wait, wasn't there one that they had Statler and or Waldorf as someone? Yes. Where was that one? Possibly. There was, there was one, and it was on Twitter. It was the person's name is Brad or Bradley, and they get listed out like a bunch of different characters as the actual Muppets. Nice. So it was like Vin was Natalie Dyer. If I slaughter names, I apologize. Kelsier was Gonzo, Elend was Scooter, Cezad is Kermit, Dachshund is Rizzo, Ham is Animal, Breeze is Fozzie, which is just funny, Clubs is Dr. Honeydew, Spook is Beaker, Marsh is Rolf, Straff is Sam. Pause, just one second. I just love Spooks as Beaker because no one can understand him. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. I do have a disagreement. I think that Ham should be played by Piggy. Well, Miss Piggy is supposed to be Lord Ruler. Yeah, but I think Piggy should be Ham because one, she's a bruiser, and two, the the wordplay is too fun. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, and then Hoyd would be uh, Statler and or Wardorf. That's Waldorf. right. Hoyd That's right. Statler Hoyd. <laughs> so, the concept of Hoyd just talking to himself, being both Statler and Waldorf, I think is too good. <laughs> That'd be pretty good. Uh, so these are all really fun. So anybody who entered, you guys made us laugh it was great yes you did so, and if you're curious you should check out our social media accounts and it's just from read the comments it was like post. back from january 17th so if you wanted to yeah. go back and look for them the pic it's got a picture of Mistborn the final empire so mm-hmm. uh now we are always looking for interesting topics to discuss on the show and that is where you can help write in ask us questions about the cosmere or drop us your idea for a topic you'd like us to discuss during the show now this is especially pertinent because our next episode is episode 50 and we are going to be doing a mailbag episode where we read emails from our listeners and answer questions discuss topics that you bring up and theories and all sorts of fun stuff this is one of our aluminum foil hat theory episodes so Mm -hmm. Write in and let us know what you would like us to discuss. Any questions you've got about us. I mean, we won't necessarily answer two personal questions, but if you have questions about us, even feel free to send those in. If you've got questions about the Cosmere, if you're not quite sure how something works, and if you just want to interact with us, you know, let us know what you think. You can send that all of those to Cosmere studies at gmail.com. And hopefully we'll actually be able to discuss it. In two weeks. Mm-hmm. And then the next yep. one after that is going to be the romance in the in Roshar. So yep. So post Valentine's Amy's, Day. Amy's going to do her part two of, of the romance. And, you know, a little nod to Valentine's Day in February. So, yeah. We wanted to make 50 special for not romance yep. reasons because that would be weird. So we're going to. Now, from aside that. from the show, we do each have other personal projects we're working on. Amy, what are you working on right now and where can we find you outside the podcast so my facebook is coincidence cosplay and props my twitter is at coincidence cosp because my name is too long my well, instagram is gonna get to that <laughs> <laughs> and my instagram is at coincidence underscore cosplay and i have a website so i can sell things which is www.coincidencecosplay.com and uh so i have my miss cloak fabric I need to finish up making my uh, pattern for it. And let's pattern. see. Pattern. Wrong series. Yes. Oh, um, 
Okay. And I've been working on some some green dice. I finally got a green in the rotation, and they're embroidered, but I need to finish them up. And then I have my tree topper that I'm working on, which is a uh, a Death Star to go on top of my Christmas tree for next year. <laughs> it's really cute. It's about like it is. It's like six inches tall, and it's adorable. It is a star, so it is. Yeah, <laughs> that you, and I. Are you gonna work a laser light in there as well? No. Oh, no, gosh, it's just, it's just gonna it's gonna be low tech because yeah I don't I don't want to stress Rosie out because she is there she going gets to be a lasers. event that uh, if one of the other ornaments flies into it and no, shoots there's it, there's it, a little it. hole where the laser where like the it's, shoot it's not, it would shoot but it's not going to be a fully operational battle station. no it is oh. not fully operational um, but yeah so I have that and I'm I'm making my I'm, I'm looking base. forward to hearing more of, <laughs> from Darth Amy in the future though Darth Amy. That was terrible. I apologize in advance for, or in retrospect for that. This is afterwards. Um, no, and the other only other thing that I worked on is I, I made my my I'm most of the way done making my base for my D and D rogue. So I'm gonna have like some black fabric that I can roll out and stand on like it's my base for if I was a miniature. So it's cool. Nice, man. I, that I, is I like awesome. I, I like the part where Amy retroactively apologized in advance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that skilled. <laughs> Jordan, how about you? What you what do you have going on and where can we uh, find well, you? Well, when I'm not hearing Amy come up with a likely title for this uh, episode, I am now able to be found at youtube.com slash splice stream. Thanks to all of you who have uh, followed me on YouTube. We finally got it to my name, not looking like a bunch of Linux has spilled all over my YouTube channel. Woo-hoo! I actually might have a video the same day we post this episode online, so all about the basics of how to train your amiibo if you would like to join in on the insanity that we do over on my twitch channel twitch.tv slash splice stream how to train your drag amiibo no that sounds like something else it does it does anyway and as for myself when i'm not here i've got a bunch of board game reviews over at the innkeepers table at www.innkeeperstable.com so i am planning to do a post-mortem review of uh, post-mortem but, yes yes a betrayal of, legacy uh, betr- of a betrayal legacy yeah post-mortem definitely um, it actually it actually applies okay but I'm, I'm planning to do eerie. a review of it but there are 12 more chapters of that game to play before i'm really ready to do a review so that might take some time in the meantime hopefully i'm getting i, I did actually play uh hedgelord so hopefully i'll get that review up soon I now actually have a space to take the pictures that I normally do, so I'm going to try and get that done ASAP. Um, I also post about these games on social media, so head over to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at at Innkeeper's Table to check those out. Now, for those of you who want to support the show but you can't become a patron just yet for any reason, we would love it if you'd head over to Apple Podcasts or honestly whatever app you use to listen to podcasts and drop us a review. It really helps us out. And even more helpful, tell people about us. You know, Share the podcast with your friends and just help us spread the word. Now, any final thoughts on, the, uh, on Sanderson's first law of magic? before we head out it's really interesting to apply it to all the books i read and yeah it's it's yeah i'm still surprised at how much soft magic i read that i didn't realize was all soft magic Mm -hmm. and i also realized i have a lot of books i need to read (laughs) in my bookshelves the thing i was really struck by is the fact that brandon went to his first convention got ganged up on and he didn't sit there and say to himself I'm doing it wrong. He sat there and said to himself, what, how am I thinking about this wrong? And mm. came up with his own rules that didn't just explain how he does things, but how other people do things and how they can be effective both ways. What I love is that Brandon talks about this. Like he's like, and I humbly named it Sanderson's first law. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is that he makes that joke. But not only did he do that, he went on to create two more laws. Well, sort well, of three. three. <laughs> two and a half more laws. Um, and he's just like, you know, he, he's very aware that this isn't a humble thing to do. But he did it 
twice more afterwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is the same man who created a Kelsier and Hoyd. How humble can the man be? <laughs> oh, man. Well, t- to be fair, he also created Spook and, you know, no, other characters. You can tell like he was that, stretching so. himself there. Kelsier and Hoyd is his headspace. <laughs> I think you just want it to be. <laughs> of course I do. Come on. They're the funnest <laughs> characters. Uh, in addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 730 p.m. Pacific time, 1030 p.m. Eastern. Listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by doing a search for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. For our next episode, we are going to be digging into our mailbag and backlog of questions. We'll be answering questions about the Cosmere and responding to fan theories about what might be coming up. If you've got questions or theories for us to discuss on the next episode, make sure to email them to us. Once again, that email address is CosmereStudies at gmail.com. And if you want to join in on the discussion live, make sure to head to twitch.tv slash innkeepers table on February 10th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's, there's always, always another, another secret. secret.